Spring Global Adver Adversarial Capability Model. <laughs> I should also probably avoid putting, what, five-syllable words in my titles, apparently. I think that that's probably unwise. Um, this presentation, I actually gave this uh, weeks are going together. At the end of May, in Barcelona, at the Anti-Fishing Working Group conference. Um, so there is a paper that goes with this, which I'm obviously going to abstract away from. But if you do like to read papers, it's that I am a big fan of making what you're doing transparent and clear and available. Um, so like the open source code from the first presentation is great. Um, this is not code, right? So this is a, a, a way to make sure that we think about what's going to happen in new risk assessments. Works. <laughs> Basically, this is Intel stuff. And so there's not open source code for this because it's for your software for your brain. So the English is the open source code. Uh, you all probably have this memorized by the end of the day. So we had a quiz on the legal stuff at the end. So I hope that you're all speed readers. We'll see you again this afternoon. Yeah. So that's actually just a that's the prelim for the test that Alan is going to give you. Uh, so I'm coming at this from the defense side, obviously. Uh, sorry, you know, more on the defense side. And the goal of Intel, though, is to let you do something. Right. Intel that doesn't let you do anything, it's not particularly useful. Uh, this basically means that we need to predict how the world is going to be. Because if you're going to do something about it, you need to know how the world is going to be, because that's what you want to change. Uh, so, fancy words, we're going to predict the future state of the world. Right now, that's sort of hard. Like, can anyone tell me what the biggest attack on the internet is going to be in six months? Usually not. Can you tell me if there's going to be a way to break into a Windows 8 box in six months? Yes. Yeah, there's totally going to be one. <laughs> I don't know what it is right now. But it's going to be there. Can you tell me if there's a way to break into the water system that controls the tap water to get to this building in six months? Maybe we don't know as well, right? So what I'm trying to answer with this work is we sort of all know that Windows, a bunch of people are going to break into it. We don't have as good of an intuition about some of these other systems that are coming online. So what I'm trying to do here is take the lessons that we all sort of know from how Windows is broken and how people have moved through the phases of being able to break Windows and applying that to figuring out how they're going to break all these other systems that are in their lives. Right? And so that way, I can predict what it's going to be like in three years instead of in two months. Because if I can predict what something's going to be like in three years, I might be able to actually plan for it. But if I only know what something is going to do two months out, that is less than everyone's acquisition cycle and everyone's hiring cycle. You can't get someone through HR in two months. How are you going to plan for four months out? Right? Like three years, we're going to be able to do something. So as I said, the tech advances quickly. And in general, new tech creates these weird, complicated interactions that are hard to predict. Um, but adversaries are using tech as a tool to meet their ends, so we know what their ends are. We can probably get a better idea of what tech they're going to use. Because if the tech is on the internet and open source, and they want to get into your castle, then they can get it, they'll get into your castle. Um, the other thing that we sort of have to watch out for, so uh, a little bit of stray Byzantine history, uh, Constantinople, I think the walls of Constantinople were not breached for 1,400 years. Does anyone know what happened in 1450? They invented cannons. <laughs> and the Turkish emperor commissioned a 28-foot-long cannon, built a road to wheel it to Constantinople, and shot at the walls for 26 days. And then castle walls didn't work so well anymore. We got to be able to predict those sorts of things because now those things happen every six months. So uh, there's a bunch of things that model attacks. 
right? So we have the kill chain. If you want to do attribution, you can do it the diving model, which basically just wraps the kill chain up and helps you think about a couple of different attacks. We have this way, good way to think about adversary objectives for for campaigns from even like 98, right? The common language for computer security instances from 1998. Um, Tom Longstaff and a guy from San Diego did that. But none of them really helped me predict the next attack. They just let me figure out what happened yesterday. So I want to figure out how to talk about tomorrow, not yesterday. Um, the thing that I've found is difficult. Some of you may have noticed this. Uh, you don't always know who you're talking to on the internet. I found this is very hard for uh, meat world analysts to really think about. Like, tell me who did it. It's the internet. Someone on the internet did it. No, tell me who did it. I need a, I need a name and a place. I got to go get a guy. But nah, there were like six proxies. They used Tor to get into the proxy network. They're all compromised machines. Could be anywhere. No, tell me who did it. OK, look. The internet is not a physical network. But what are you talking about? What are computers? Like, OK, look. I don't care who it is. The thing about the internet is everyone is connected to you. There are some folks at CMU who did a risk assessment of the electric grid. There are transformers to get the power into this building. It turns out that we don't make them anymore. And you can take them out with a sniper rifle because they're just in the middle of the woods. They were very concerned about this for a while until they realized that no one goes in the middle of the woods with a sniper rifle and shoots the transformers because we catch them. Because you need physical access to the thing to be able to destroy it. That's not true on the internet. Everyone has physical access to everything because that's what being on the internet means. So the adversaries only need the capability and the intent to get you stuck. They don't need physical access. So if they don't need physical access, I only need to model their capability. And then you need to figure out if they want to get to you. And then that's how you figure out how much money you need to spend, basically. So uh, these are all fancy words to get me accepted to an academic conference. What this means <laughs> is that I had some interns read everything there was about XP, and I also synthesized, you know, the facts that I've been working on this for five years. It was like, oh shit, XP's been broken for a while. Am I allowed to swear on camera? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> like, oh man, this sort of is like the same thing that happened to the other Windows 95. And this is sort of the same thing that, you know, has been happening to Android. And like Windows 7 turns out it's still broken, even though ASLR is nice. Or right? like, because they started to get past ASLR, basically, what, three, six months after it came out? So after you see the same pattern and the same process six or 10 times, like maybe, maybe I can figure out what the pattern is. And then if I can figure out the pattern, I can predict the future states of the world and get people to pay me money. So what we did is I did this loop, came up with a came up with a strip with a model, uh, showed it to a bunch of people at CERT. They went, no, that's dumb. Do this, this, and this better. And I went, no. Oh. oh yeah, that's true. We did it again. And I showed it to some more people. And they went, mm, this is better, but these things. Okay. And so then I presented it and they were like, eh, I don't see anything particularly wrong. I'm sure there's something. So I'm sure that there's something else wrong with this. This is why I tell it to more people, so that one of you can come up afterwards, hopefully quietly, and not ask in front of everyone and tell me that it's stupid. I uh, should make it better. But if you insist on embarrassing me to make sure the point gets across, you can tell it to everyone, that's fine. So adversary identity is not the focus. I said that already, right? You can't find it anyway, so just don't worry about it. Um, but I want to know how good all of the adversaries in the whole world are at attacking this thing. Right? Uh, we've done this for four things. Um, and one of the things is actually not attacking, but controlling. Right? So I think that adversaries have a capability to compromise a particular system. That's going to be different than administering a botnet. Right? It's not the same skill set to administer a 100 million node botnet as it is to compromise 100 million machines. Those are different. Uh, and also, some of them feed into each other. 
right? So you don't have to compromise 100 million machines with the same operating system, but they might all be controlled the same way. So we're going to model those things differently, and then what I haven't done yet is figured out how those things all sort of mesh together, but I think you can sort of see it from where I am that, you know, if there's a firewall, there's their capability to get past the firewall. And then there's the Windows machine. Once they get past the firewall, they have their capability to get against the Windows machine. And then once they compromise it, they have their capability to control it. Right, so those are three capabilities. They can do all of those things. They can get into your system. You guys all know that. That's not hard. The thing is, how many people have that capability right now? So the model is how many people have that capability. How many people have it determines how much it costs. If the capability to compromise Windows is open source, it's free, everyone can do it, you have to spend a lot of money to stop it from happening because everyone could possibly want your system, even the electricity that is running to mine Bitcoins is going to come after it. That's a little bit different than if you have a closed down system that no one really knows about, you have to spend less on it because there are fewer people with the capability to compromise it. So, one of the things we ran into, I know that definitions is everyone's most favorite thing, but we're at like 10.30, so I think that everyone's at least like perfectly awake, right? No one's just had lunch and tired of this yet. <laughs> Which is also all, 10.30, it's sunny out. I don't know how we got a sunny day finally, right? It's, we had coffee, so, so we have one slide of very intense definitions, then you'll be tired for the rest of the day. You know, <laughs> make sure that no one else can do anything useful. So. The capability is having the things and knowing how, but knowing how is usually on the internet, or it might be, or it's in papers, or it's in hacker forms, or like, where is this that you have to buy it? Is it $100? Is it $1,000? Is it a million dollars? A software system, as I alluded to, is a set of software instructions that executes in the same environment and runs with the same set of permissions. So, has anyone ever tried to remove Internet Explorer from Windows? Yeah. Does anyone then run up against the little website that says, by the way, you can't do this because we built it into the Files Explorer and uh, we hate you? <laughs> yeah. You run up to that real quick. So, the thing is, if you compromise Internet Explorer, you compromise the Windows kernel. At least in XP. They tried to make it multi user later. I'm not sure if they really. That means that. Internet Explorer, the thing that goes and fetches random unknown web pages and just executes them, is the same software system as the Windows kernel. This is the reason why we have some problems with Windows. This also means that if I model Android or if I model Linux, Firefox is one software system and the Linux kernel is a different software system. And those are different. But for Windows, it's the same because you can't take Explorer out. And so we got into some weird space where I thought that I was modeling the Android kernel capabilities, but it was actually modeling the Android user space because those are actually different. And that's when I realized that Windows is this terribly, awfully useless. But um, that's why this is important. So what we did is we organized this into phases. I have this pretty picture of the moon, to, you know, phases of the moon, it's like a pun. But it's not actually a pun, because the pun would be funnier than that. So we have discovery, validation, escalation, democratization, and ubiquity. Right, so you start with discovery, and you go through. You don't really have to see validation to know that you're going to move into escalation. They pretty much go in order, but there's a couple of things that make this hard. Um, one is that some of these things are kept secret. Right, so when we did the XP one, we had a report from 2010 that the military had problems with the Chinese breaking into their XP systems in 2003. All right, so we didn't know until seven years later that validation of espionage had happened for XP. So sometimes you don't know that one of these symptoms has been observed until way later. But we know that that's going to happen because these things are secrets, right? Of course people aren't going to tell you. But, so that's why we looked at XP to be much later. So one reason you might see things moving faster than you think is that one of the other things has actually happened and it just hasn't been reported. 
Uh, the other reason is that if people know that they can make money and do espionage on the thing, they might go on to creating um, well-funded or they might be well-funded organized actors in the space, right? Before you see people actually doing some sort of denial of service attack. Um, so you're going to have to see at least one. I propose might be wrong, but it hasn't been proven wrong yet. So that's what we're going to go on because science that if you see one of these symptoms, that phase has started, and then you might start to see another symptom from the next phase. But you won't see anything from, you won't skip a phase, but you'll see one symptom and then you might see the next symptom. And then you might go back and complete the prior phase. But I call it phase completed if you've seen all of the symptoms. And part of the predictive power comes in is if you see all three of disruption ability, monetary gain, and espionage being validated or approved by doing some sort of compromise, then we're going to move into escalation soon because all of those things are done. So I have four case studies. Depending on how much you all want to see them, I have three of them in backup slides, and I'm going to definitely go over the Windows one, and I'll take some questions. And then if I still have time to kill, I'll do the other ones. So we made these fancy graphics, because everyone loves graphics, especially higher-ups who don't really get paid, don't really want to. The higher-ups need to get the summary of the stuff, the hard work that we've done. We need to obviously have that in a one-page graphic, usually a map, but I can't bring myself to make a map of the internet because it's not a physical system. And I hate that idea. But so, the darker the box is, the more it's been seen. For giggles, we also charted the market share of XP across the bottom. I have no idea if this actually correlates, but it looks like, obviously, uh, if something is more popular, it's more likely for people to move against it quickly. I know that all of those things are very tiny, but basically as soon as Windows XP came out, you had the first bulb and the first exploit, um, which was a UPnP exploit. Um, you also actually had the first, just proof of concept, uh, a worm in the goner worm. Right? And then you see, so by the end of 2002, discovery is done because Windows has actually sort of been around since 95. So when XP comes out through that late 2002, it's already pretty well hashed out. Those were code reuse problems. Um, you see proof of money pretty quick, proof of espionage pretty quick. So shadow crew stuff, um, money starts to happen. And then you see Blaster. Um, and so this is this phase where like everyone was crying all over the time because the worms were just spreading through the whole ecosystem. And so that's proof of disruption, because when the internet goes down, that's disruption by infecting Windows machines. Right. So that means that if you know that you can destroy something, you have some power over it, right? Anyone gonna like do in quotes? No? Come on, guys. <laughs> Um, and so if you have the ability to destroy or cause harm with Windows XP, then you have the ability to do espionage. Like I said, uh, we get the backdated reports about the espionage in the military. Um, we have Russian criminal gangs using it uh, to steal financial credentials all by mid-2003. Okay. And then you basically get remote command and control, zombie king, all of this stuff. You go through, by the end of 2007, it looks sort of bad. But if anyone was in this industry in 2007 and protecting XP machines, you were like, OK, this is OK, but like, I'm not really happy about this. Right? But people start paying attention. Of course, this is, new, this is when people realize that like everyone's on an XP machine and everything is sort of actually broken. But it's not really broken until you get to the last half of the life cycle, where you get Zeus being for sale for $600 to anyone with a stolen credit card that'll pass $600. Right? And then it goes down to 60 And then it gets open sourced. Right? And then Metasploit is open sourced. And then Metasploit is updated continually with open source updates for XP exploits, which is this second one up the top there. And the one at the end is end of life. And so when we have that whole stack filled up, we have free control, 
free exploit. No more updates. How expensive is it to compromise a Windows XP machine right now? Right, we laughed about that. I think it's what, 40 seconds if it's connected to the internet un unprotected? It might be, it was five minutes like two years ago, I think it's gone down. Because they'll steal the electricity you have. It's cheap enough that they'll steal the electricity. Um, if you go back, right, when you have just military grade security being compromised, there's not just like people in someone's basement in 2003 compromising XP machines in quite the same way. Right? They might be putting in 100 hours to do it themselves and just not getting paid for it for some reason because they like it, but it's 100 hours worth of work. Now it's five seconds worth of work. It's however fast your internet connection is to download the Zeus files, right? Um, and so that changes how much you have to spend to defend it, it also changes how much you have to spend to attack it, right? These are the same. So I put forth that we should model this adversarial capability as going in stages. Um, I think that we have a reasonable reason to think this. I think that it helps us figure out a future threat landscape a little bit more accurately. My estimate is maybe that it stretches us to like 18 months to three years out instead of six months out or something like that. Um, because I think that it helps us make predictions. Now, I can keep going, but I want to give you guys the opportunity to ask any questions or comments. Yeah. Where is Windows 7 on that XP chart? So I haven't done, uh, so I haven't done a rigorous analysis of that, but there is definitely Windows 7 malware, right? <coughs> is it open source yet? I don't actually know the answer. I'm actually asking. Does anyone know? Because there's been a couple of other things that have been open source lately. I don't know if Zeus has Windows 7 plugins. The problem with Windows is that there's code reuse. So some of the XP modules still apply. The real thing that I think uh, so this comes into the definition of software system being tricky. I think that the new thing for seven and eight is that they turned on DEP and ASLR by default. Um, and that is a different software system, basically, because that gets in between the user space and doing whatever you want. And so I think it would be better not to say what's the capability against seven, but what's the capability against ASLR and DEP since those get turned on much more easily in seven and eight. Um, and I know that there are definitely proven attacks against those defenses. But if you don't have ASLR and DEP running, like I think that you're basically in the same boat as XP, more or less, except for that you get patches. Yeah. Does anyone disagree with me on that? We just heard how easy it is to break into the whole Windows ecosystem, so I don't really feel too unjustified in that. I don't disagree, I just have a question. Um, as somebody who would want to use the model uh, and, and its predictive power, what I don't see in the model is how the attack focus changes over time as well. So for example, if you're a government organization uh, and you're in the early stage of the model, you're a victim in the early stage of the model, you have two things that I don't think the model addresses. One is um, you're likely not to share that information widely. So knowledge of the exploit and the capability remains very limited. And as that knowledge spreads through escalation and ultimately to ubiquity, the targets of the attacks shift as well. So going back to the governmental organization, if you're somebody responsible for protecting against that particular capability or mitigating that particular capability, there needs to be something saying how worried that person needs to be about future attacks involving that capability because it seems based on the model that it quickly shifts away from the people who have the early knowledge to the lower hanging fruit that are more publicly accessible. Could you repeat that? Yeah, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, <laughs> Not easily. I'm going to try to summarize this as basically I don't handle 
uh, distribution or extent of damage by getting the particular item broken because I don't talk about how widely distributed the software system is. Um, and we also don't talk about where you would actually apply pressure to do something useful, especially if you're the person designing the system. Um, I think that it's cl pretty clear from this that once you hit escalation, you're going to run away to ubiquity and it's too late. Right? So that means that if you design a, sof if you design a software system, you need to uh, basically not have it be targetable. Because once you get uh, proof of money or proof of disruption ability, it'll probably run away into escalation. You can try to tamp that down um, by keeping a by keeping a hold on that. Um, but really, it means that if you don't prevent the actors from gaining the capability at a very early stage, which is an asymmetric cost, right, you won't be able to get a hold on it once it gets away from you. So I think that that's the recommendation. Um, that's not very nice for people to hear, because it means that A, a lot of systems, because it basically breaks down to the build security in principle, right? It, I could retranslate what I just said as the security stuff has to be built in from the beginning so that it doesn't get targetable so that no one builds the capability to destroy it. But no one does that because marketing reasons. So unless it basically gets legislated, it won't happen. There were a couple over here. Yeah. Yeah, so how you pick like very, like you pick XP, you pick Android, I forget what else you have on your list. Apache and uh, control, remote control of industrial control systems once they're compromised. Yeah, so like industrial control systems and like more <laughs> distributed systems like that, let's say a, a, a cloud system like Azure or Amazon, or how does this model kind of expand those bigger distributed type systems that may or may not have security built in? Because as time goes on, we're moving more towards those types of systems where it's not just an individual device, it's a bigger cluster yeah. of systems. So the question basically is how do I deal with distributed systems, which I'm going to go back to my definition of software system. All right, so any set of instructions that run in the same environment are a system. Right, so Azure is one system that you would have to, is it? I don't know if Azure has different user modes or whatever. But I think that if you have the Amazon Cloud, it spins up a VM for you. So you have the base OS or the host OS, right? You have the virtualization software, and then you have Amazon backend. Those are three systems. So you can model them separately. And you would model them separately. And so whatever host OS someone spins up, like we'd see this with web content management stuff all the time, right? Those are host. The virtualization software, there's um, there's papers from 2008 by a guy named Cavus Ormandy who basically published that all of the popular virtualization software at the time could be exploited by a hostile guest to get control of the host. He was immediately hired by Google and hasn't been heard from since, as far as I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> I wish that were a joke, right? That's just what happened, as far as I can tell. Yeah, so, um, and then the back end stuff, I feel like I saw once in the news that some Amazon management stuff had their password entry page open for like two hours and someone got in and guessed the password and like did a bunch of mischief and then Amazon closed it down, right? So that's the back end management side, right? Which has gonna obviously have fewer bones in it. But I think that it would be unwise to think that there's not value in compromising the whole backend for Google or the whole backend for Amazon. And so if there is any capability to do it because it runs on a Linux system, then it's there, right? They haven't built a whole new kernel, as far as I can tell. So. How, how does the model change as you multiply these systems together? I think that the what changes in the model as you multiply the systems together is something that I sort of in response to Mark's question happens actually a little bit outside the model is the the risk of a compromise or the damage done when a compromise occurs goes up and so the risk of com the, the the cost benefit should change right so if you know that there's a system that a hundred billion people are using and you know that it has you know this far along 
you should adjust your equation to spend an appropriate amount of money on the security of it, right? Uh, we saw this, I think, with the Project Aurora stuff at Google, right? They thought that Gmail had no exposure, turned out to be targetable, and then they went on a hiring spree because they realized they needed to adjust, right? And I don't know what they put in after that because they don't tell anybody. But we've seen some instances of this, but they're obviously not as far along as XP is, partly because they're custom systems, right? And partly because there are fewer of them, so they're not as targetable. Yeah. So would you say that uh, eliminating the use of Internet Explorer uh, secures systems, Windows 7 and Windows 8.1 because yeah. So what I would say is that if you can at all do it, don't let anyone leave your local network with Internet Explorer. I've seen um, presentations by the Exploit, Exploit Intelligence Project, I want to say, um, where they measured some of this stuff. But what the guy also was doing was um, he had a company that was selling basically a plugin that just put Chrome inside Explorer and ran all of the sandboxes as if it were Chrome unless you went to a local network site to try to make that transparent for everyone. Um, but yeah, basically, if you can prevent people from leaving your local network on Explorer, that would cut off some of that exposure. And I know that there are some programs that just are required to run Explorer locally or whatever it is, but. Well, we developed software and whatnot to do a little bit like the SaaS model, so we wanted to like a security standpoint that because there's PHI information and whatnot to eliminate that would secure the So at the very least, definitely support at least one other browser. Yeah. Right? If you're doing a software development thing, please at least support something besides Explorer so someone is at least able to make this other choice. Because some of the reason we have this problem is there are websites that are like critical, that are developed to only run properly against Explorer. And that means that the security folks can't do the right thing and switch everyone to another browser. So yeah, at least like Firefox isn't perfect, but if you run Firefox on Windows, I'm pretty sure that they have to at least do something else once they get the browser to get the kernel. I'm not sure that's really true about Explorer. Like there, those other things that they can do are sort of well known, but they have to at least do it. Yeah. Uh, so it seems like the older something gets and the more widespread it becomes, the more expensive it is to secure. But by the same token, it's less expensive to support. Yeah. So if those two things are inversely proportional, is there a sweet spot where I can run something obscure enough to not be a target, but still popular enough to be supported? So the question was, as something gets older and better known, it's more expensive to secure, but it's also cheaper to support. So what's the like min-max function on this? Um, the optimal thing is going to de be determined by how targeted you are, right? So it depends on how many people want your stuff. The, the more attackers you have that want your things, the lower that sweet spot's going to be because the more expensive security will be. Um, if you're doing basically nothing important and they only want to steal your electricity or farm bitcoins, um, then it's probably pretty far along that you can use a pretty common system. Um, but also note that some of that cost in securing is going to go into other systems that are going to go in front of these systems. Um, so you can also budget it that way. Right? They're like, we're going to have Windows on the back end, but that means that uh, you know, like email's got to be stripped or cleaned or whatever in a certain way, and then let in signed attachments, right, from people who are in your contact book, right? So everyone's got to run PGP or some sort of email signing thing, which Outlook supports now, right? So we do this sort of stuff, but those are the sort of costs you're going to have, not necessarily IT costs, but human costs, right? So no one can receive JavaScript in their email because they're running a Windows machine unless it's signed. Right, so then you have to do a public key rollout for everyone. Like that's the sort of cost I think I'm talking about. There's one over here. So the, earlier in your talk, you, you mentioned about how uh, um, how Zeus is very Zeus, uh, kind of the modular, so the open source, and things like that. I'm curious, first of all, does Zeus have any insights in terms of those kind of new capabilities? Are we seeing advances and things like uh, polymorphic capabilities to avoid detection? Are we seeing other advances because of that? Uh, so the 
question was, is malware becoming harder to detect, basically, like polymorphic stuff and all of these things. Um, I don't have that modeled here, but I think that that's actually a reasonable separate thing to model, is their ability to bypass not just AV, but any sort of malware analysis. Um, and so based on the model, I would predict that they're getting better at it. I don't have anything specific for you that I know that I can say. Uh, how about here? Uh, last question. Have you noticed any, any any trends with this model as far as timing? Like, does it uh, does it take you know longer to go from discovery to validation or from validation to escalation? Um, just thinking ahead, you know, if, if we see that a tool is at the at the validation stage, can we make any generalizations about how far we might be until we get escalation? Generalization is a little bit hard because I think it's a function of how many machines there are. So it's a function of the value proposition for the attackers. All right, so with the Android API, this all fits on one slide. The Apache one is three slides. The XP one was two slides. So they move at different rates, but I think that's partly because Apache is so much older, there were just fewer web servers, period. And so there wasn't as much value in getting after them. There is 800 million Android phones or whatever it is, so it moved a lot faster. Uh, but there's, so there's not a general rule, but I'd like to think that there's probably some sort of um, relationship between the number of devices that, and the number of people going after it. Um, that you could come up with something, but it's, I don't have a hard and fast one. But it looks to me like, um, so this Android one goes real fast from validation to democratization. That's like two, 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 two and a half years. Right? So I think that if, we, if you expect to have a new popular tech out that's gonna hit a big segment of the global population, you should expect it to go real fast. Thanks, everyone.